Hello, I'm John Sargent, and welcome to Argumental, the show where the hottest names in comedy debate the biggest issues facing mankind. Will David Cameron win the next election? Are we paying too much for gas and electricity? And if Lady Gaga is so successful, how come she can't afford any trousers? <laughs> Here to argue such pressing issues and others like them are in the red corner Marcus Brigstock and special guest Charlie Higson. <laughs> and joining Rufus Hound in the blue corner, please welcome Simon Day. OK, let's kick off with round one, where we debate a topic that's getting many of our skimpy knickers in a twist. I'm talking about this. Sex, from TV to tourism, pop to politics, we're bombarded with images of female celebs bearing their knockers and tabloid debates about the contents of David Beckham's wife lines. Our pop stars look like strippers. Five-year-olds wear T-shirts with porn star on the front, and there isn't a man in the world who hasn't seen Britney Spears' Lady Garden. <laughs> so, the issue I want the teams to argue over is this. There's too much sex in popular culture. Proposing this statement on behalf of the blue team, it's Rufus Hound. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, there is a time and a place for sexual imagery, and that is in my head. <laughs> And I'm not alone. Chances are that half of this audience know exactly what I'm talking about. The half with, let's call them, penises. <laughs> the penis is both a blessing and a curse. A blessing for any lady lucky enough to be speared on one. <laughs> but a curse for the bearer. By the age of 16, penis owners are forced to live with the schizophrenic nature of existence. Your head brain is trying to enjoy a little light poetry. The time has come, the walrus said, to speak of many things, of shoes and ships and sealing wax, of cabbages and kings. And your head brain is happy, sated by the culture that it's absorbing. But the other brain, your trouser brain, <laughs> is thinking, I bet I could fuck a walrus. <laughs> and that is why there's too much sex in popular culture. Men are engaged in the permanent struggle between head brain and trouser brain. And there may be even women here now thinking, my man isn't thinking about sex, he's thinking about cricket scores or pub quiz trivia. Well, chances are he's thinking about those things to blot out the white noise from his trouser brain that's <laughs> telling him to ring your sister. <laughs> and if you think it matters that she looks like a walrus, well... <laughs> bad news. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, for the good of mankind, I urge you, vote blue. Thank you. Next up, opposing Rufus for the red team, it's Charlie Higson. Thank you. Um, I love sex. It's great. I love doing sex. I love thinking about doing sex. I love practicing for it. <laughs> sex is what makes the world go round. We none of us would be here tonight if it wasn't for sex. And we've all of us done it. I've done it twice. <laughs> Even John Sargent over there has done it. In fact, I expect he's done it a hell of a lot more since he's been on Strictly Come Dancing. <laughs> And, and there is a case in point. Why does anyone watch Strictly Come Dancing? Let's face it, it's not for the dancing. It's for the parade of Russian mail-order brides who, st <laughs> <laughs> who stick their legs in the air whilst wearing not very much clothing. <laughs> sex is the driving force behind all popular culture. Without sex, there would be no popular culture. And all the technology that we've invented to, to mass-produce popular culture has been driven by sex. The printing press. The very first things that were printed was usually pornography. The internet. The internet would not exist without pornography. As I'm standing here now, the air around me is full with pornographic images being beamed by satellite. The air is absolutely... <laughs> Exactly. The air around us tonight is full of minge. <laughs> M 
MILFs, barely legals, pony girls, men who shave their pubes to make their cocks look bigger. <laughs> Pornography is civilization. It's what separates us from the animals. Animals don't make porn. <laughs> they appear in quite a lot of it, yes. <laughs> but judging by the looks on their faces, I don't think they really know what's going on. <laughs> so what I'm saying is, if you take away sex, you have no popular culture, there is nothing left. And I think the only people who could complain that there is too much sex are those that aren't getting enough of it. <laughs> I rest my case, thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Charlie. Marcus and Simon, would you like to add anything to what your teammates have said? When I see a lecture like that, it makes me wish I'd been at university. Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> but, unfortunately, didn't address the actual issue. We're talking about the never-ending onslaught of sexual images where we haven't asked for porn, we haven't asked to be sexually reminded, We've, we're, we're going about our business and suddenly, oh, if you drink this, you can do that. But we haven't, we haven't asked for any of that popular culture. We haven't asked for all those adverts and all those exactly. billboards. At least it makes them more interesting if there's a bit of sex Yeah, in but there's it. a terrible to... price to pay, isn't there? Because women look at these billboards and these films of these beautiful young women and they think, I can't live up to that, I'm going to have a cake. And they can... <laughs> <laughs> we don't need the notion of sex permanently thrust down our throats. No, we don't. <laughs> Yeah, but, we, I mean, for instance, Hollywood films. There is no sex in Hollywood films. When did you last see what? two... They don't. There's kissing and glamour. That's sex. There's no sex. Kissing is sex. No, it's... No, it suggests sex, so it's not actually well, I, sex. Well, I consider that it? sex. <laughs> <laughs> having sex is like having a nice dinner, but making love is like having a nice dinner and having to eat your vegetables too. <laughs> So is there too much sex in popular culture? It's time for our studio audience to decide who made the best case. For Marcus and Charlie, hold up your red card. And if you think it was Rufus and Simon, hold up the blue card. Vote now. So, a clear victory for the blue team. Well done, Simon and Rufus. They've convinced our audience that there is too much sex in popular culture, something I'm sure you'd agree with at home, if you could see what was going on under this desk. <laughs> <laughs> Believe it or not, I did actually appear naked in an advert once. I didn't want to, but the people at Anusol said it was integral to the plot. <laughs> our next round is called Flip Flop, where we find out how well our teams can argue with themselves. I'm going to give one member of each team a statement which they must support until they hear this sound. At which point, they must perform a U-turn and argue against it. Then flip-flop every time I press the buzzer. Marcus, you're up first. I'd like you to start off by arguing that Britain needs more airports. Yes, of course. Britain needs more airports, ladies and gentlemen, because airports are wonderful places. Where else can you go and get felt up for free? Uh, my house. <laughs> That's one of the places you can go. Of course, we don't need more airports in this country, and anyone who says that we do is an idiot or Jeff Hoon. Uh, which is one and the same thing, and he knows we need not only more airports, we need airport expansion. Uh, we need to float Boris Johnson in the Thames and put an airport on his capacious tummy and a terminal in his massive, stupid mouth. <laughs> and then sink him. Because what Britain does not need is more airports. That is the last thing we need in this country. More railway stations. That's what we need because British people enjoy queuing and delays. It's what makes us British, right? Uh. Not right. More airports is what this country needs, ladies and gentlemen. We need massive expansion. I think each of us should be allowed to have an airport and our own duty-free so that we can buy Toblerones that are over seven metres long. <laughs> we need, don't need, more airports. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. Well, flip-flop. 
There was talk of building a new airport in Norfolk, but it was cancelled after the locals successfully protested about the noise made by the howling metal cloud boats. <laughs> OK, Simon, you're up next. I'd like you to begin by arguing that psychics provide a vital service. Off you go. Yes, of course they provide a vital service. They're a marvellous group of people who can basically look into the future and tell people who aren't that bright about things that have happened <laughs> on the other side. You know, the other day I was watching a programme, there was a marvellous psychic on there. I can't remember his name, I had the sound turned down. But along the bottom of the screen, all these fantastic messages from beyond the grave saying things like, Edna, the money is on top of the wardrobe in a jar. Uh, it's ridiculous. The tea leaves. What a ridiculous idea. Who thought that up? It's so lazy. Oh, I know. A couple of people in a the tent. There's someone outside. How can we rob him? I know. We'll tell him. We can see his future in this old teacup. He won't go for that, will he? Why? He's an idiot. <laughs> Let's be honest, they are a marvellous group of people. I can read your palm. Can I read it? No, only I can. Oh, it's terrible. All those years masturbating and slapping people. My whole life story is on my palm, but I can't read it and you can. Do you want to read my ball bag? <laughs> They're rubbish. They're ridiculous. Tarot cards. Oh, what's that? The hanged man. That must be terrible. Actually, no. It can mean a rebirth. It's a photo of a man hanging for a bit of rope. There's <laughs> a marvellous picture of a house being struck by lightning. It shows people you should be careful when you buy a house in an area where there are thunderstorms. <laughs> They're brilliant. Well done, Simon. Time for the studio audience to decide who flipped and who flopped. It's red cards for Marcus or blue cards for Simon. Vote now. Right, a clear blue majority there. Commiserations to Marcus Brigstock, but congratulations to Simon Day. Join us after the break when we'll be arguing that we should all be proud of Prince Harry and it's much better to be dead than alive. Don't go away. <laughs> Welcome back to Argumental, the show that promises more verbal ding-dongs than Vanessa Feltz on a speak-your-weight machine. <laughs> Right, next up is the slideshow, where the teams illustrate their argument using a series of pictures which they've never seen before. Charlie and Rufus, you're up for this one. Charlie, I'd like you to start by arguing that it's better to be dead than alive. Here's your first picture, and away you go. Uh, to be or not to be? That is a question. So said William Shakespeare. Uh, unfortunately, like most of Shakespeare, it's utterly incomprehensible. <laughs> but I think what Hamlet was grasping at was... Um, why do we carry on eating our way through the plate of cold shit that life serves up to us <laughs> when we'd all be better off dead? Uh. Speaking of uh, plates of cold shit... <laughs> life is like a very long aeroplane journey, a long-haul flight to Australia that just goes on forever. And after a while, you're actually thinking, God, I wish this plane would crash. <laughs> And it would all be over and I could sleep the eternal, carefree sleep of the dead. Uh. All we get in life is crosswords from people. Um, <laughs> because let's face it, the dead are much happier. Have you ever seen a skull that wasn't smiling? Uh. One of the pharaohs did actually have inscribed on his tomb, I am sick and tired of feeling sick and tired. He wanted to die like the rest of us. And like I do, standing here with this eternal stream of bloody photographs being thrown at me while I whitter on about being dead. Uh, I rest my case. We'd all be better off dead. Thank you. Thanks, Charlie Rufus. I'd like you to argue the opposite, that it's better to be alive than dead. And here's your first picture. Off you go. It's better to be alive than dead. Hooray! <laughs> Being alive makes you want to jump for joy. Although Charlie's odd mixture of pathos and self-loathing is certainly compelling, 
Uh, it is not the be-all and end-all of this argument, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let's uh, begin this presentation. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's telling you that life isn't canard at times. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we are all, at one time or another, at sea uh, with our own emotions, but it's our responsibility to be captain of that ship. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, frigate, I've got no idea. <laughs> This is very hard. <laughs> Look, bollocks to the pictures. <laughs> I've been stitched up here. So if you're going to stitch me up, whoever's in charge of the pictures, good luck keeping up with me with your clever cameras. Because, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> you and I are all the same. We are all together. If we say, oh no, evil can be done over there, then we don't look at where we are with each other. We can reach out, we can hold, we can touch, we can love. There is a man who I could love. <laughs> you do not grow a moustache like that without having the capacity for real joy. <laughs> joy that it would not be possible if you were dead, my friends. I would kiss you until we were dead. <laughs> and at that point, our spirits would wrap together for all of eternity in one bearded spasm of joy. <laughs> You can stick your boats up your bum. <laughs> Along with this chipmunk. <laughs> because if there is one thing I know, nothing will make you feel more alive than an anal chipmunk. <laughs> yes, even a chipmunk can smell the promise of real nuts. The universe is heading towards heat death as the sun expands and we are all blown away. In that moment, are we merely atoms unable to relate to one another or are we people with dignity and love and hope? Um. <laughs> <laughs> Proof if it were ever needed, that there is no God. <laughs> Thank you, Rufus. A, a very brave effort. Um, <laughs> Marcus and Simon, would you like to add? How can you wish you were dead? Think of all the wonderful things in the no, world. It's not... It's Real not... ale. It's... <laughs> <laughs> Look who's dead. Hendrix, Lennon. Uh, Peter Cook, look who's alive, Noel Edmonds. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> the reason Hendrix is so wonderful is that while he was alive, he did incredible things. I don't know how much composition he's done since he's been dead, if anything, decomposition. <laughs> There's a joy in just getting older. This notion yes. that you have to Not die young true. in order to be Not great. true. Find me a truly happy, proper old person. None of them are. <laughs> no, he's not properly <laughs> old. He's not properly old. How dare you, Hal? John Sargent is 47. <laughs> <laughs> Years of political journalism have been hard. No, it was, that was a wonderful moment. Thank you, Rufus. I won't, I won't forget that. <laughs> Time to ask the audience who made the best argument. For Charlie, hold up the red card. Or for Rufus, hold up the blue. Vote now. Think of Morrissey, people. Dead. <laughs> you see. Come on! It works. <laughs> <laughs> okay, a, a dead easy victory for the Blues. Well done, Rufus. It's said that only the good die young. One shudders to think of the evil that Cliff Richard must have done. <laughs> Time now 
for our celebrity round, where tonight's debate is all about this officer and ginger inbred man. Prince Harry, the copperhead, former Chelsea-loving, royal with the relaxed attitude to race relations. He looks good in uniform, British or SS, with a body desired by women and a full head of hair envied by his brother. A tank-driving, substance-abusing, taboo-breaking prince, he's very much a Renaissance man. Renaissance being his favorite Windsor nightclub. <laughs> but the statement I want you to argue over is this. We should all be proud of Prince Harry. First up, supporting the statement, it's Marcus Brigstock. Ladies and gentlemen, as the great saying goes, some of us are born racist, others achieve racism, <laughs> and some of us have racism thrust upon us. But who amongst us hasn't gone a little bit late to a fancy dress party, panicked? And the next thing you know, you turn up in a Nazi uniform and there's an international incident. <laughs> but for many, many years, younger brothers who weren't first in line to the throne have plotted and planned and schemed and murdered and cajoled their way into power. Not Harry. He has no ambition at all. <laughs> the best he can hope for is that he manages to get from the door of China Whites into a taxi without being sick into a camera. <laughs> admire that. It's a commitment. This man went to Eton. Now, you may have mixed feelings about that school, but I can tell you that the education on offer there is fantastic. He only achieved two A-levels. <laughs> you get one A-level for arriving at Eton. <laughs> Prince Harry is thick and rich. It was either the army or banking. <laughs> he gave active service in Afghanistan, a very dangerous place. He could have been shot by Americans. <laughs> And of course, let's not forget, he is a ginger. It's pretty hot over there, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, news story came out that it cost us over a million pounds to safeguard him. 850,000 pounds were spent on sunblock. <laughs> he makes me proud, and I have no doubt that he makes you proud as well. Please, vote with the red team. Thank you. <laughs> Well done. Next up, opposing Marcus and Prince Harry, it's Simon Day. Ladies and gentlemen, what my honourable colleague Marcus Brigstock fails to recognise is this man represents the English nation. When I go across the world on expensive holidays, I go to Thailand and they say, where are you from? I say, England. And they go, oh, David Beckham, Simon Cowell, Prince Harry. He brings shame upon the nation. <laughs> what he needs is a mentor. You can imagine Prince Charles. They're terrified about this bad PR. Look, Harry, everyone's very worried about this racism. I brought a chap along to, to talk to you about the black nation. It's Ainsley Harriet. Hello, Harry. All right, how are you doing? <laughs> A bit of green peppers there, some mushrooms, a bit of cream. You're not being very black, are you? <laughs> I'm teaching a break dance or something. I mean... <laughs> what he needs is a job, a proper job. He's completely ineffectual, like most of them. What he needs is a nice little shoe shine box outside Buckingham Palace. <laughs> the tourists come along, they watch the changing of the guard, and Harry can polish their shoes and maybe get a bit of humility at the same time. He can have a little board next to his shoe shine, men's shoes, five pounds, men's boots, seven pounds, ladies' shoes, three pounds, no coloureds. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks very much. Charlie and Rufus, got any views? Well, I actually think Harry is a, is a very good role model. Um, he's an example that we are no longer a class-ridden society. It shows that you can really get on in the world, in, in modern Britain, without being directly related to the royal family. <laughs> <laughs> but isn't that the point, that ultimately... The, re the only reason we know about him is uh, what he was born into and that as we should live in some sort of meritocracy, he just remains one totem of the fact that no matter how hard many people in here work, harder than him. Which do you really think is harder work? Strolling down here once a week, doing a little bit of comedy, yeah. or going out in the army to Afghanistan and Iraq? Really, really, which is, I which what, is Charlie, hard work? In fairness, last week's audience were bloody hostile. Were they? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll work. withdraw that. Which I would accept 
if he was out there fighting with the people with whom he trained... Which rather, he tried to do. Which he did try to do, but didn't. That's a bit like me saying, I slept with Claudia Schiffer. Christ knows I've tried. <laughs> all right, thank you all. So, should we be proud of Prince Harry? Once again, it's down to the studio audience to decide whose argument was the most convincing. It's red for Marcus and blue for Simon. Vote now. So, it's definitely a win for the Blues. Well done, Rufus and Simon. <laughs> They've convinced the audience that we should not be proud of Prince Harry. Poor Prince Harry. When I say poor, I mean very, very, very rich. <laughs> Time now for the final quickfire round and a last chance for our teams to show just how argumental they really are. I'm going to show them a series of pictures. All they have to do is suggest an argument to go with them. OK, here's your first one. This is an argument for falling house prices. <laughs> this is an argument for not renting Mickey Rourke your home in Oscars week. <laughs> I think this is an argument that Lionel Richie is taking his lyrics too seriously. <laughs> But imagine that, what a feeling. <laughs> Let's move on. <laughs> this is an argument that if you don't get on with your ice cream man, you shouldn't ask, can I have a big flake in it? I think it's an argument against a diet that is too high in fibre. This is an argument that not only answers does your bum look big in this, <laughs> but also does this look big in your bum? <laughs> <laughs> Next picture. I think that's an argument against assisted suicide. <laughs> Certainly an argument against getting acupuncture on the NHS. <laughs> Is it an argument against going to an old people's home and asking who wants to get hammered? <laughs> <laughs> OK, that's it. So for the final time, it's down to our studio audience to decide who made the best case. Red for Marcus and Charlie and blue for Rufus and Simon. Vote now. So I can tell you that the blue team have won the round, which means this week's winners are the blue team. Well done, Rufus Hound and Simon Day. Commiserations to Marcus Brigstock and Charlie Higson. That's all we've got time for. Good night. Argumental is back on Tuesday night at 10. In the meantime, carry on the arguments and join Dave.co.uk by reading exclusive Argumental blogs written by Rufus and Marcus.